And then this should be on now. If you want to do a little testing. One, two. Testing. If, if you can hear John Lee. Can you hear me? Chat message. Okay. Cool. And I think we're good to go. This works. Okay. Good morning, uh, everybody. There's a few minutes delay while we set up our new uh, video setup. But, yeah. Uh, so John Wei needs no further introduction. So John Wei will complete this uh, lecture series. Thank on you. Uh, thanks, Chris, and uh, order to bring the much better new projectors. <laughs> I think the people sitting in the back can see better. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for her good questions you asked yesterday. Then as I say, the, I will be around today and tomorrow. Feel free to ask me questions. Okay. I, Let's get us started. Well, so lecture, as I told you. Okay. Uh, tell me if you cannot hear me from the back, okay? And uh, as I say, the purpose of my lecture is to give you enough information about QCD and also give you a big picture what the QCD can do for the hydrogen structure related to the physics. Of course, uh, within this limited time, I cannot cover all the aspects of QCD and also by doing so, prepare yourself, prepare all of you for the rest of the week. So you understand what the people talk about it. Then uh, in the handbook is very, very comprehensive for the TMD physics. We talk about unpolarized observables, observable with polarizations, talk about symmetries. So after first two lectures, this one, I will tell you more about the, how the spin observable is defined and how to make a judgment from a theory so this observable either it's exist or not exist, I mean, they, they cancel when you take a symmetry. So the way to do that is take advantage of a symmetry of the QCD, especially parity violation of parity conserving and the time reversal conserving part of the QCD. So I will give you a number of examples how to use that, how to apply those symmetries, how to tell which is a good observable to look at it for speed dependent quantities. At the end of the day, at the, near the end of my lecture, I will tell you, you say, well, after all these, everything's related to structures and non-perturbity. We use a perturbation theory to define a tool to see them as a probe, but at the end of the day, you try to get the information which are non-perturbity. As we know, the hydrogen structure is non-perturbity. Then can we calculate them from lattice, from first principle? Because the lattice is giving us a very well-defined tool to calculate non-perturbity physics. So I will try to connect them, what you learn so far to what the lattice can calculate. So then lead everything to the TMD. So Yang will pick up more, they tell you more about TMD physics. That's a goal. So let's start it. First, let me talk about spin. What is it? So spin often is another observable. Then you can change. So it's like, uh, as I said yesterday, every cross section is a probability. It's a measurement. Whatever the cross section is a classical observable, even though there are a lot of quantum effect taking place, but whatever you measure the cross section, that's a classical observable. Now, sometimes if you want to really see quantum correlation or quantum effect directly, I'm sure your condensed matter colleague probably told you, I look for correlations. You know, if you measure cross sections as a classical observable, you want to see the correlation. So in this case, in the high energy experiment, use the spin as another norm. You take a difference observable cross section at a different spin direction, say divide by some. The difference often can subtract away some of the quantity dominate contribute to your probability, but leave something you can see directly correlate to the correlation, quantum correlation of the QCD. So in a sense, by measuring the symmetry, you have a possibility to see the directly the quantum effect in the QCD. So I will give you exact example how to achieve that. So that then before we do that, I have to define what is the symmetry. How would you? Thank you. I noticed that this 
uh, every day I change a new uh, mask. The morning mask is so so new, so good. I run over breath very quickly. <laughs> yeah. So what is the what we say is the cross sections. You know, you have a sc scanning amplitude your cross section square. That's a cross section proportional to the square amplitude square. It's a probability. It's a tap positive definite. As we talk, we can expand the cross section in terms of the large momentum transfer, the leading power, next leading power, next and next leading power. The QS, sometimes people are just some scale, define the soft scale compared to hard scale. Then this could, sometimes people use a lambda QCD, some people use a Wong R, the radius of hadron. But some people you could use a, you know, if you twist a four over twist two, then use a, some typical scale for the quantum correlations. But it's just a symbol here. But in principle, you can do these expansions. But the bottom line is, if it's a cross section related to the amplitude square, it's a positive definite. Then spin average cross section often we define that is a cross section is a spin with one direction plus the spin cross section with spin flipped. Then you average it over. That's also positive definite. However, when you do the asymmetry, we define the difference of cross sections. In that case, it, there are several different ways to define it, depending on the direction of the spin. One example, the ALL, that L means longitudinal polarized. Now you have a two thin collide. So you have a two low indices, then LL means both beam longitudinal polarized. Then you define a symmetry by flip one of them or flip both of them according to the way you, some of them related by uh, parity or symmetry. So you can flip a both, uh, the both of longitudinal polarized, as you can imagine, ATT means the both are transverse polarized. ALT is a one longitudinal polarized, one transverse polarized. And also, it's very, very interesting. You'll hear a lot of it. Do the experiment with only one polarized. Another beam can be unpolarized. In that case, you can have say to A sub L, then longitudinal polarized. It's a very interesting exercise. It tells you if the theory, underlying theory for the observable is like QCD, which can serve the parity, then that LL is strictly zero because of parity conservation. Then same time, AN mean the transpose price, same theory, but you will find that A sub N is not equal to zero. That's a challenge, that's interesting. Then, uh, so that's what we talk uh, through these lectures. So then, first of all, I will talk about the spin program because you polarize a proton, right? Then the polarization of a proton has a two interesting role. I want to emphasize the proton. First of all, the proton is a composite particle. So it's a spin is a consequence of internal dynamics of a bound state. If you talk about the spin of a composite object with a condensed metal colleague, who is a basic training in the quantum mechanics, then they tell you that's easy. I just superposition of the all the spin I know of at the end of the total spin. That's what you learn in the quantum mechanics. Now, if you tell the, your colleagues, say, I have a proton spin half, 30% from a quark, 40% from gluon, they say, forget it, nonsense. What are you talking about? A spin is quantized. Everything is either half or one or digit, is a half integer or integer half. What do you mean the 30% or 40%? Well, in a quantum mechanics, it's true if you have a limited number, no matter how big a number of object particle involved, as long as the number is n is finite. In the quantum mechanics, you do the superposition of them at the end of the day, it's a quantized spin. But in the field theory, it's a bit different. Number of particle never fixed. Quantum fluctuations take place all the time. So the number of the quarks that grow on inside the proton, it's not the fixed number depend on scale, how you probe them, and also the quantum fluctuate all the time. So at the end of the day, what we measure is a contribution to the proton spin from a quark to gluon, depend on probability to find the number of quark, probability to find the number of gluon. So then multiply to whatever quantum number has been half for the quark that has been one for the gluon. So that's the reason we end up with a fractional or probability for this uh, contrib spin contribution. That's a key difference to keep in your mind when you communicate it with the people more concentrated on quantum mechanics rather than the field theory. So, in so then the next one, because that, after that stage, I will emphasize then that, that, 
So this proton spin, we really like to decompose the proton spin in terms of the quark gluon degree freedom, help understand the dynamics of fundamental QCD bond state. So we talk about cross section. We talk about how the particle produce a distribute that controlled by the QCD dynamics. But in the QCD, quark gluon has a spin. So by looking for a spin observable, you have an actual probe, actual knob to turn to learn the PCD dynamics. That's very important. And a new. So then also, that's one, the one important part of the proton spin program is you can, by study, do the experiment to understand how quarks gluon contribute to the proton spin. And also, there's a dual role of the spin program. You can use the spin as a tool. Instead of studying the details of how the proton spin you know, has been half, where they come from, then you can use the spin as a tool. The example is a cross section probability, but still classically measured. You can use a spin symmetry by taking difference of two cross sections involving two different spin states. Then you actually will access, be able to access directly quantum interference in the QCD. That's a wonderful example I will show you. So that's a background. So now that talk a little more detail about spin. We know we learned in the, in the quantum mechanics class, well, spin was uh, introduced a long, long, long time ago by Pauli. Then it's a two value uh, quantum degree of freedom of the electron at that time. The quantized version of spin is uh, S plus S plus, not S mod by A plus one square root, that's a spin. Then, but for a composite particle, the total angle momentum represents that the, the particle, the, uh, Spin when the particle is at the rest. So this, then take example of spin of a nucleus. That's a typical example, like uh, when you communicate with a condensed matter colleague, because how big, we think of the nucleus bit by individual nucleon, then we know nucleon spin half. So you know the typical spin state of nucleus is just a superposition of those spin plus their orbital motions. So that's how, is it, because the bonding energy is so small compared to the typical lambda QCD, so you can treat the nucleon as individual particles inside the nucleus. So naturally you can do the superposition, the spin of the nucleus, the sum of the valence nucleon spin, then uh, in sense uh, also plus some orbital motions. Then now the spin of the nucleon I mentioned earlier, in the naive quark model, one of the example I started with, so if the probing energy much less than mass of the, this uh, constituent quark, then the nucleus is made of the three constituent valence quark. In that picture, the spin of nucleus is the sum of the, all those constituent quark spin. The example I gave it to you, the complete example, you define the state, then the spin is nothing that's an operator sandwiched between the state, you get a spin half. So that if this is true, then you learn the proton spin is really come from the quark spin. So that was what we believed for many, many years. That of course, now we understand better, which is not true. Then also the spin of nuclear in the QCD. In QCD, I already said earlier that in this case, current quark mass so much smaller than exchange, energy exchange of the collision, number of quarks grew on depend on the probing energies. So number never fixed. Then so what do we do? Same thing in the sense is the, what does the spin or angle momentum is the expectation value of that operator. So you have an angle momentum operator sandwiched between the proton state then that value is somehow all the flavor of the whatever particle involved, that value gave you a spin. That should be spin half. Then what the angle moment operator in the QCD is it defined in terms of energy momentum tensor that construct the angle momentum density, integral of the space, gave you the operator. So then of course, you, you know that this complete definition of energy momentum tensor. So you can construct it, the spin, there's the quark part, there's the gluon part, here is another important thing you should realize. Classically, we can say there is a spin of a uh, spin half particle, spin of the spin one particle, we can all say that. But in the field theory, when the particles move, the charge particle like a quark, carry charge, even electron carry charge. When they move, then the gauge invariance tells you it's not the spatial derivative anymore. It's covariant derivative. They all go together because they require the gauge inverse. So in this case, there is a lead immediately to some of the, not the necessary confusion of different choices, understanding. So you say, okay, I have, this is my defined operator for the quark, but of course there is a gluon involved. But that's a, well, 
it's a definition with R, the X cross the motion that's operator for the angle momentum. But the motion in this case, it's not just special derivative involving the covariant derivative, which I give you the good operator, but covariant derivative, as you know, all depend on the gluons. And also this gluon operator is a very natural like, like a pointing of uh, vectors. So that's in term E field and B field in the QCD version of it. Then that's a gluon operator. So this is a wall of very well good definition, but there is some ambiguity here. I will come back to that to you later when I talk about the orbit angle momentum. So keeping in mind in the gauge theory, when the charge particle move, then you always have a, whenever you have to talk about derivative, it's not the normal spatial derivative. You have to have a covariant derivative. Okay, so what do we know so far before I go into the detail from a theory point of view? So far, this is a decomposition, angle momentum for continuing from quark and a gluon. So you have a, but the decomposition is that the right-hand side, it's not uniquely uh, fixed. We made it one choice early, but in principle, left-hand side is measured half. We know the protons can half. But right-hand side in the decomposed is a different term. So there is a one decomposition known as you have a holistic contribution from a quark because if the proton moving in direction, quark holistic in that direction contribute to the proton spin and also the gluon. Then naturally think about orbiting a momentum contribution from the quark plus the gluon. Then uh, there's a lot of debate about how this composition works, whether or not you can have separate the gluon for JG into the delta G and the LG, whether or not you can have, you can never can separate them separately. So a lot of, lot of debate we can discuss in detail later, but the point is if, if you have a, the idea that every single of them is not directly physical observable, it's not like a cross section you measure. So whatever the decomposition you have, the physical interpretation depends on how this quantity can be connected to physical observable with a controllable approximation. Because all of these operators is given by the matrix element of the quark field and the gluon field. Matrix and the quark field, gluon field never be directly physical observable. Because you know, you never see quark and gluon in isolation. So what is important is that you have spin half in the left, that's a physical. So you have to find other measurement cross sections, asymmetries. Then from that, you extract delta sigma, delta G, this quantity has to be gauge invariant. Gauge invariance of the operator is a necessary condition for the quantity you can extract from the experiment from physical measurement, but not sufficient. At the gauge invariant operator does not mean they can be directly physically measured. For the quark, because the quark field, gluon field, you never see them in isolation. So that's a concept, and be careful whenever you talk about decomposition, you can write down the in the gauge invariant term, but the, to test them, you still have to relate this quantity to the physical observable with controllable approximation. So let's now summarize what the after 30 years effort, quark roughly about contribute 30% to the proton spin. We learned the gluon contribute roughly about 40%, within the range of a momentum fraction we have been have access to. So that means including rec data. Then we still have some room, so orbit angle momentum contribution, but we don't know much about it. But whenever you talk about orbit angle momentum contribution, you have to know the transverse motion of the particle. That's why it comes the TMD and the GPD becomes very important. So this, so far the first two terms are really like holistic contribution. But if you really find the proton spin have sensitivity on this part, that means we really like to learn the transverse motion of the protons. So that's a background. So now let's come to the theory part. How we understand that, how you can make a contribution, solve these puzzles, okay? So we start with simple, like we said many times, always start something simple. Then in that case, we said lepton hadron scattering, I can polarize both lepton and hadrons. And the resolution of the Q, that's a large momentum transfer, which is much smaller than the size of the proton. Then also the, uh, this uh, Bjorken variable, X Bjorken, we defined a number of times before. So now that recall from lecture two, you remember I can decompose the hydronic tensor regardless of what the spin is uh, in terms of four independent scalar functions known as structure functions. Then if you do the spin average experiment, you mean the sum, then you will find that this term, they cancel each other. 
So in the in the sum, then so they don't contribute. So you measure f1, f2. But if you take a difference of the spin, you realize that this term get canceled. You end up with measure the g1 and g2. But all this relation depends on the direction of the spin. Then you know when you talk about direction, we emphasized last time, talk about transverse momentum, dependent towards the frame. That where the axis of the collision is, whether it's a the hydron, in this case, lepton lepton frame, no, lepton hydron frame, or the exchange of virtual photon hydron frame. They are different. So you can see if you define frame between lepton and hydron as your z axis, or you define frame based on the photon and the hydron as z axis, then the direction of spin is not the same. So any vector will depend on the choice of the frame. So that's very important because I will show you next slide. So I have to define the frame. So if you imagine I have a spin, this is going in the z direction in the lepton, then the hydron have a scalar lepton define a plane, then I have a spin in this uh, direction. So I have uh, several angles. The ang one angle is the angle between hydron spin and the direction of the leptons. So in that case, I call alpha, but that's an angle. Then the, you can imagine this case, so you sit in the hydron rest frame, that's to make life a little bit simpler. So whether or not you have a lepton coming hit you, or uh, you, if I have a virtual photon come to hit you, but it depends on the choice of frame. So the idea is you have to define your frame. Then you have, a, now you define the difference, a symmetry, define a, a scattering with a spin in with one angle, then minus cross section with the angle plus pi. Then lambda is holistic for this uh, electron. So then you go to also a little bit algebra we had on the last slide. You will find the answer is a two depend on G1 and G2. But the turn, how they depend on it, depend on the angle, depend on exactly spin directions. So that's very important. I, and in the sense that here, I make life a little bit simpler. I define this part as along the lepton direction. So you only have helicity. You don't worry about angle. So angle is related to the spin vector of the hydron with these directions. So then suppose I do the, the symmetry where you construct from the experiment, people can choose the angle alpha equal to zero. If we choose alpha equal to zero, this turns gone. So in fact, you can measure this asymmetry. You have access to G1 and G2, but you realize there is a difference. G2 is the proportional one of the Q squared. G1, the leading trend is proportional one. So if the Q squared is sufficiently high, measure this symmetry, you have a direct access to G1. So that's one example. Then another example say, so, well, I really want to run the G2. What can I do? Because if this is the case, if you do it this way, G1 is so big, over the take over the most event, how can I extract the G2? Well, if I take the pi alpha to be 90 degrees, so in that case, this guy goes to zero. So everything will be here. So what you measure is the sum. In fact, with the G1 plus G2 with a fraction of Y. Y is a, a controlled variables. So this is how you do the experiment to connect to the function you want to extract. So I gave you a couple of examples of the status. For many years until now, we only have this many data for the G1. You remember I showed you yesterday for the F1 or F2. There's a many, many data cover the five order magnitude in the Q squared, the four order magnitude in the X. That's spin average. But when you do spin dependent, when you take a difference across section, you rate the much, much lower, then you will find the uncertainty is much bigger. For the G1 so far, this is the only thing we have from a select experiment, you know, from 30 years ago. But now we hope to get an EIC. We are under construction now. And then 10 years down the road, we shall be able to have it. Then this is what we expect the, to have the data. So you can see we will be able to learn a lot about this uh, uh, spin dependent structure functions. So now that's a connect the observable structure function to the physical measure quantity. Now, next step, as I did in the first two lectures, we have to understand the structure function in terms of quartz gluons, right? So I follow the same logic you will find by polarized. So we learned that this is the lowest order diagram you can deploy in the parton picture. So F1 structure function, just the parton quark distribution, quark distribution weight by chart. F, you, work that, you can work that out, we did it. Then the G1 is from the same definition, operator definition, you will find it will relate to the, uh, the holistic distribution for the quark and anti-quark almost identical. 
then, uh, then you will have what's a holistic distribution because the uh, spin average is being dependent. This is not the quantum state. For a given particle, the quark, the quantum state, either it's a plus helicity or minus helicity. So average is just the sum of those two, then uh, the uh, helicity distribution, just the difference of the two. So imagine this is a probability to find a quark within the pro, a polarized uh, a proton with a plus helicity, then that's a probability with a minus helicity. So in the picture wise, imagine the green is the spin direction of the proton, a, a red is the spin direction of the quark. So this is a plus helicity, the minus the situation where the quark helicity is the flip proton and chat. So that gave you the so-called holistic distributions. So now furthermore, because all if I just do this composition, this is a probe, photon with entire proton, then this is a non-perturbity. What the basic line at the leading twist, as we discussed, is a matrix sum you measure is an I and a J, like the Ian showed, the I and the J spin index for the quark field. Then, so now the question is how this quantity can depose, decompose to independent quantity, but when this hadron is polarized? Well, it's a simple question to you, quantum mechanics questions. Quark is being half. I have a two line, quark line, Fermi line. What is the total number of state you have in terms of the spin? Four, right, maximum state. So what we do is that we often write in the so-called, this is the definition of operators. Then you can, if you can just W is nothing but the contract with this part of the diagram give you a W. But the real question is how this function can be decomposed into independent function. I already gave you the quiz already say this function maximum, if it's a collinear, there is no additional factor involved, then maximum you have a full state. So how the full state will be made up well, we, you can either write the plus helicity, minus helicity, and a transverse spin state. The transverse, you have two directions. So you have a total of four directions, that's it. Or you can do the linear combination, the sum of the plus and minus helicity term or difference of it. That, so this is related to the sum, spin average, this is related to spin dependent, and this is a transverse spin, dependent on spin direction, so those are the, exactly the state you have in terms of number and also in number of independent distributions. So putting the operator, I said, put it back. So we have three, why three? Because I will tell you this operator in principle transfers, you can have a two direction, you know, transfer can have either y, x, y, or any two directions, but you can prove from parity time reversal, I'll show you in the next couple of slides, the only one survive is the one the direction around the direction of a nucleon spin. Because the nucleon is for transfer prize, if a nucleon prize in the x direction, then quark still can have prize the x and the y direction. Then the, from a parity time reversal inverse, you can show if the quark prize the y direction, that matrix sum equal to zero. Then the only one they are parallel. So this transversity corresponding in the picture is the quark is the, around the direction of the polarization or spin direction of the hydro. And so that's known as transversity. So you have a lot of unpriced, one two prize, and the transversity distributions. So now in terms of the picture, I mentioned to you earlier, is a prop look like a square of the amplitude. You have this is the sum, this is the difference. And that difference is the direction that had to be the quark polarization is related to the same as the, the spin of the hadron polarization. And uh, as I told you earlier, you can define the longitudinal polarization either into the holistic state projection operator one plus minus gamma phi over two, or you define it in terms of average or holistic state. That means uh, the sum of this and the difference of this. So then it's important. This part is very important. I say from quantum physics, you know how many states, but I told you there are only three states survive. You need only three independent functions. What is the criterion? Use a spin physics. That's a symmetry of the PQCD. So I'll tell you this is a, a very basic of a spin observable. Typically, you have a cross section proportional to matrix of an operator. The operator made of a quark field and a gluon field. That's a genetic. <laughs> Example, you can imagine an operator like a side bar gamma psi. Gamma can be you know, 16 gamma matrices, any one of them. That's exactly what we normally measure. So then you apply the parity time and reverse of it. See what happened because the state you want to invent study is a spin in one direction minus spin in another direction. What's the relation between them? So then you have to relate how to change the spin 
from plus to the minus without changing the momentum. That's a difference you want to compare. How can you achieve it? Apply P and a T. When you apply parity time reversal together, you keep the momentum and chain by spin flip. So this is the way you do the, this is the operator. Then you can prove under the parity time reversal is exactly equal to the stay with the spin minus spin direction flipped it, but the operator get a dagger and the P and a T operation on it. The reason you can have the dagger is the time reversal is not unitary. So you have to have this, uh, there's a complex factor. So you have to get eventually the operator later dagger of the operators. So then with this, then you can test. So this relation, whenever you construct a symmetry, so this, if, the, the, if this quantity, like here, at the end of the day, for whatever the given operator you have, then if this quantity you have is equal to, then because uh, you can see this is here is equal to P and S, then the relation between the same operator with the spin in the one direction and the spin in the opposite direction, if the relation is the plus minus, that's good operator. But then if it's a plus sign, then mean this, you know, that, that if this is true, because the spin in the plus direction, S direction will be equal to the same thing in the minus direction with a plus minus sign. Then immediately realize the plus sign will contribute to spin average cross section because you add two together, they are the same sign. But the, the operator with the minus sign, they can only contribute to spin asymmetries. When you take a difference, then this operator will contribute. So I gave you a couple of examples. We all know the spin average code distribution. When you put this operator, you do a little bit of algebra, you know the uh, operator form for a parity time reverse inverse, applying that, you will find if there will be a positive sign, that's this operator. If you put the gamma five there, you have to do the same thing. You get a minus sign, then you know this operator will contribute to delta Q. Then if you gave an operator like a gamma plus, gamma per, gamma five, then you do the exact same thing, you will find that you end up with the delta Q. Then also that this, you can put the direction there, the per have a certain I and J, the direction, then you realize that direction will be consistent with the spin direction of this hydro. So that's exactly for the quark part. You can do the exact same thing for the gluon part, F plus uh, alpha, but for a symmetry, suppose I put anti-symmetric in this indices, you'll find this operator will contribute to delta G, but if you put the G mu mu, a G alpha beta here symmetric, this will be the spin average gluon distributions. So understand this equation is very important because it helps you to understand what the spin observable will be contribute to the, the cross section or symmetries, what will not. So now it become that we can measure the G1 is the lowest order given by these things to the deep in the scaring. In the 1987 EMC uh, had this famous plot that measured the G1. The integral of the momentum fraction end up of this total moment, first moment. They relate to first moment, the number is pretty small. Then they can decompose them in terms of the, the so-called, in terms of G3, the difference of these two holistic distribution and all the G, a octet part is this definition. But this can be learned from the low energy is the hyperon decay related to weak interactions. So they put them together, they derive the delta sigma is the sum delta Q plus delta anti Q together is close to zero. This is interpreted as total quark contribution to proton spin. By that time, everybody, the proton spin, the more, most of them should come from the vector from the quark contributions. Then, then this lead to the so-called spin crisis. It seems quark does not contribute to the proton spin. So where the proton spin come from? So that led to the more than 30 years effort then until today, and uh, then actually uh, 35 years now, then we have to really try to understand what's going on, how the protons being half connected to the degree of freedom of the quarks and gluons. Because it seems that time, the quark contribute to almost 0% or consistent with zero. But now, as I mentioned earlier, after 30 years effort, we understand that this sum is the order of quark contribute about 30%. There's still tremendous room of a proton spin coming from the, whether it's a gluon helicity or whether it's from orbit angle momentum. So then this is the also strange quark, it's not included here. So this led to the new era of spin physics. This is also the reason behind the RIC was built with the spin 
part. Rick originally proposed for heavy ion emission, then they took advantage, including the proton proton collision with the polarized proton for spin program. And also, and now I give the example how to render the spin with different flavors. You know, there's a difficulty with this G1 because what you measure G1 is the, this is physical observable. Even at the lowest order, you never really can do this measurement because they all with the fractional charge. You have to have other observable to tell you extract this. And also it gets difficult to tell you which flavor will contribute more and which flavor contribute less. Flavor means whether it's up quark, down quark versus strange quark. So here is another example. You can separate them. You take advantage of your weak interaction, do the measurement of the S of L. I told you S of L should be zero if you only have a QCD. But if you have weak interaction, S of L is not zero. So imagine you have a Joyan process, we like uh, discussed last time. Instead of a virtual photon, you have a W particle. You know, W particle is left handed. So you prefer a certain spin state. So in that case, you have an A of L, not zero, to the lowest order, a symmetry A of L proportional to holistic distribution for the U quark, multiply the anti D quark from the another hydron, the unpolarized, then you minus uh, the holistic distribution the anti D, then these then divide by sum. X1, X2 is like what you see yesterday from uh, Ian's uh, talk on the XA and the uh, XB, then you have, a, in that case, uh, they, it's a mass over have lots of exponential rapidity. So then you can take advantage of the experiment, control your event. Suppose I move this uh, rapidity in the more forward or backwards. So if I go the more forward things, look for E plus, in that case, I will find A sub L, W plus dominate delta U over U. Then if I go backwards, it will be more sensitive delta D bar and the D bar. So the, by doing this experiment, you can get direct information how you quark holistic contribution to the proton spin is and how anti-D quark holistic contribution is. Then you can do the same thing for W minus. When you do the W minus measurement, then of course you'd measure other flavors. So you can see how to combine theory and experiment together to take advantage of the measurement then to extract different flavor contribution, uh, holistic contribution to proton spin. So next, the, what's the current status? The current status we have, say so far before the EIC, now this is the status we have on RIC. So in terms of this, let me explain, this is, this is the delta G contribution, grew up list contribution in the range of your physically measured from 0 0.05 to the one, that range is measured. Then this is the, from the range of the, the 0, 0, 1 to the 0 0.05, the RIC experiment cannot access it, but it have a form of other global fitting from a measurement have some information of it. So with the depend on value of these two, then the current understanding is that early data sees not look like gruon does not contribute to proton spin, but now it seems to be getting a better and better data, the proton contributes some fraction to proton spin, but uncertainty in this direction is huge because this is the region we have not really have a good data on direct access to that. So that's a big uncertainty. But with the EIC, we can extend all the way as expected to the 10 to the minus four or five. Then in that case, uncertainty from global fitting shows is getting so small. And the similar things that from that, you can extract this delta sigma, the core list contribution to very, very good accuracy to a small number as small as 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four. So that's what the EIC can give us. So if you combine everything together, say so what the potential room for the orbital angle momentum. So you know you don't know the exact central value. It's current uncertainty in you know, a delta G plus half delta sigma within the range of the point 10 to the minus three to the one, that's the EIC can access by the half minus that. That tells you exactly what the L is. Then also this is go to even smaller region Suppose the region you, you know, you don't complete access to it. So with this energy ring, you can see the uncertainty. They can ping down the depend on central value. You don't know where the central value is because the uncertainty here is big. But if the central value here with this arrow side, then you will have L zero. But if the central value moved over here, then L can contribute big. So we don't know exactly what it is because based on current knowledge, this is the room we have for the L. So you can see in terms of the orbital angle contribution to proton spin is completely open questions. That, so that's a message I want to deliver. This is the plot, then there's anticipation for the EIC. 
So that's the longitudinal spin. We use that measurement as a tool to learn proton spin, where the proton spin have come from. The bottom line is we learn something about core holistic contribution, something about the gluon holistic contribution, but there are still lots and lots of room to understand uh, the orbital angular momentum contributions. Then, uh, so now I do the transverse spin phenomena. In this case, I polarize something transversely. Then I told you that then A sub L single spin symmetry is zero in the QCD, but with weak interaction, not zero. Then for the strong traction, say suppose the pure QCD S of N is not zero. I made a mistake here. I was not counting when I prepared the slide. Now it's like 55 years ago. <laughs> I was not even thinking, just 2000 sticking in my mind. <laughs> then, so then, uh, so what happened is that was a proposal by Norman Chris and T.D. Lee in uh, 1966. They say, if you do the experiment, say if I do the experiment with the leptons and proids, not most of the experiment people do with the most proids. Say, let's do the experiment. This one is not proids, but the proton transfers proids. So I define a symmetry is difference cross-section with the spin flip in the transverse direction divided by sum. So they predict that time. Say in the approximation one photon exchange, then S of N, S of N of inclusive DS vanish if time reversal is invariant for electroweak, electromagnetic and strong interactions. That prediction led to the many experiments they carry out very, very consistent to be zero. Then also they show there is a little bit not zero. They even the precision to the level they find some quantum interference from lepton's part. Then by two exchange of two photons, you can exchange one photon and two photon. The interference between the one photon exchange and two photon exchange gave you a little bit of symmetry. That symmetry actually consistent with the experiment. So that's the one you can use to, to test the time reversal inverse. And if you look at that paper, actually very good uh, uh, argument uh, description how to explain that how time reversal will help you to control this asymmetries. But in this lecture, I will tell you the, a little bit modern technique to deal with it, similar to what is taking advantage of parity time reversal together. Then you can prove that whole paper, the conclusion in just literally two slides, a few steps, you can prove it because that's important. Then you remember what the cross action measure is. We learned enough L mu mu with W mu mu. Only different from the yesterday lecture is you have spin in the hydron. So in that case, well, L mu mu because there's no unpolarized, so it's a symmetric. Then the hydronic part, you know, depend on instead of two current, instead of just state of P, now spin have the spin state. So now the asymmetry is nothing but the L mu mu can multiply or contract with the difference of the hydronic tensor with the spin flip. So that's a well-defined, no ambiguity. So because it concludes SM is zero. So for us, we need to prove, say, well, I need to prove this quantity that we mu is given this matrix element. If this is zero, that means this one should be equal to that one, they should cancel. So that means that you, you have to prove either there's several different ways because this is symmetric. If you can prove this difference is anti-symmetric, then there's zero too. So if you can prove this matrix element is equal to the whatever anti-symmetrical version, then you can prove that zero. So that I put the question mark, we don't know. But uh, you can summarize the problem or define the problem in such a way how to prove this equal to zero, end up with show this quantity, either they are equal, they cancel, or they anti-symmetric compared to this guy. So let's do the proof. I show you the formula most important earlier, I didn't give derivation. Now I give you the derivation, then where this formula you derive. So I define the two state. One state involving the operator with a state, this one I call beta. Another state is simple. It's not a unique choice. You can move J over here. Okay, I want to make life simpler, define this way. Because in this case, it's like operator. So then the time reversal is not unitary, so you have to be careful. When you apply time reversal state is a VT acting on the, this operator, you change the both the spin direction and the uh, proton momentum direction. When you apply beta to it, it's tricky because you have to have dagger because that's time reversal requirement because it changes the verse to complex to the imaginary. The real, the, so they, they take the complex dagger. Then, so then you sandwich it in the unitary, put it in the minus one, 
then the one plus the seven will be trained. So this gave you operation on the one current to another current. Then this uh, uh, V come over here, act on that, take advantage of, uh, you get the minus sign. So then the inner product of a reverse state equal to this definition. Then you work it out, you will find alpha and the beta dagger. You improve it, it's the beta minus alpha. So you apply that the current. This is the relation, time reversal invariant relation is given here. So it's not the just simply flip, they have to have a time reversal state. So then you apply that operator on the J, you know, the J electromagnetic current. Then you immediately prove that this Spin minus minus apply the, the spin operator, you go back to the positive sign, then you end up with the J. So this is the relation you derive. Then with this relation in your hand, so now I'm going to use further, sandwich the U here in between here and here for parity. So what the parity did we do, then parity will change the momentum to the positive by the keep of the spin and change. So then you do the same thing for this side. Then the parallel operator combines the time reversal operator. You act on this J and act on another J. So you apply that, you will find the parity time reversal change the Y to a minus Y. Then the zero continues same as zero. Then because this operator have a translation inverse, you shift this to the zero, shift over here to the Y. But the difference because this reverse, you, you know this a mu and a mu change compared to mu mu. So you prove the relationship for the state of the new mu with the minus spin equal to the plus spin with the mu and the new. So that's a proof without any approximation. So well, with in your hand, you immediately say, well, the symmetry of the proportion L mu mu multiply that, then I can replace the second term from what I just derived over here. This is the anti-symmetric. So that tells you this asymmetry has to be zero, exactly. Then, so this is a very quick proof. I tell you also how to apply uh, P and the T. Then this is a very important. Then, and also, oh. so that's a single spin, that's a history, but what's a modern situation? Then uh, the unsolved puzzles. Then now the single spin symmetry I told you should not be, you know, there's no theory say the A to N has to be zero. Actually, experiment did the measurement for many years, since the way back in 1976, all the way to now the Rick time. They measure a symmetry for the pion production. You have a proton-proton collision, one of them transverse polarized, another one is unpolarized. You produce a pion. Pion is, does not have, it's a spin zero, right? So then you plus pi, pi plus minus, it seems they gave the opposite asymmetry then a symmetry as a function of the XF, what's XF is a longitudinal momentum over, of the pi over the total momentum allowed is to say twice of the P longitudinal divided by root S. So that's a variable. That means when the large XF means the particle you produce more forward around the direction where the polarization is. Then so they find a very consistent from the low energy to high energy, you continue to have a large asymmetry, even go to the energy like 500 GeV root S, then you will find asymmetry is still there, but of course asymmetry getting smaller. When you go to high energy, asymmetry getting smaller, but still there. So what the really measure is asymmetry defined as you have a transverse polarized proton, and with the unpolarized proton, the hit produce a, a pion. The pion either goes to the left or this asymmetry corresponding to left to right asymmetries. So corresponding to being flipped. So the question is, do we understand this? As soon as the first measurement in 19, early, later 70, about a single spin symmetry, theory, you, you, you believe me, theorists jump on every phenomenon, try to understand it, to explain it. So then the first is immediately, 1978, very famous paper by Goody Ken and John Pomplin and Wayne Rupko from Michigan. Then they say, well, this asymmetry cannot be true because the first that they measure it's like a 30% asymmetry. This is too big because from a QCD, they say, if I apply the a cross section, as we say, there's a hydron, there's a, a particle from another hydron, I have to put the proton fragment to the pi on, so I have to exchange the gluon, uh, but quantum theory, you have to sum of the all this amplitude with same initial state, same final state, then square them. When you square the leading term, it gave you the leading cross section, but that's not sensitive spin. When you take a difference, because spin requires a phase, 
Then you, when you take the difference, you end up a symmetry in the proportional interference of these two diagrams. Then this diagram, you get a symmetry, the phase coming from this loop. Then you will find that uh, because the additional line contribution, this a symmetry divided by cross section made cross section leading term from the denominator symmetry is the same diagram without additional gluon. So the symmetry should proportion alpha s because the gluon gave you two coupling constant. Then also this loop, you have to flip a spin. QCD is vector interaction. No matter how many gluon turn, you cannot flip the helicities, right? They can serve. So only way you can achieve that, you have to have a mass of a quark. Then you divide the proton, the dimensionless, the PT you observe, then that's too small. That number close to zero asymptotically. So that's impossible to explain the data. So then also, so what do we need to construct the symmetries? A symmetry is a scalar observable. In the sense, you have a spin vector, then you also have momentum, contract the two momentum. Then you, that's a way you construct a, a scalar. The uh, I required to be the time reversal invariance. Then if you convert these two, this is three vectors. But QCD in the Lorentz invariant form, you need to put in the four vectors. If we put a four vector case, you require minimum four vectors. You need a phase required of, a, they gave you the a spin flip, then that means there's a spin. Then you need enough vector to construct the scalars. But if you look at the inclusive DRS, and that's one example we went through before, we proved that it's zero exactly, but just for fun, you go back to check, you don't have enough vector to construct this symmetry vector scalar anyway. So that's another way to convince you that has to be zero. But here you can see if this happened, then the, this uh, vanish if the power tunnel transfers moment equal to zero, because asymptotically it's, that's what you conclude. So the question is, how can you get the current understandings of SN after all this year's effort? I will use one slide to summarize, then give you an example of how to understand it. So far, as I told you, asymmetry plays a very important role. For include S as zero, and the parity time reverse inverse, and also fundamentally, you just look at the independent vectors. You only have a three independent vector, cannot even construct a Lorentz scalar uh, asymmetries. Then also, you can look at this now. I look for this observable with additional particle in the final state. In that case, a Q square much larger than lambda QCD. Then you can, it's like a cities, you produce an additional hadron. Then you can look at the region when the transverse moment is the order of a Q, just like Ian yesterday, Julian cross section. You can have a PT of Julian order of a Q. So in that case, you only have one large momentum scale. In that case, the collinear factorization. In order to generate a single space symmetry, as we learned from a work done by uh, John, uh, by the Goody Cannon company in 1978, at the leading twist, you don't get that symmetry in a proton type of pictures. So then the reason you to eventually you get to this asymmetry at the re situation, you only, only have a single hard scale, then it has to be twist three. Then I will give you exact example how to understand that. Then also you have situation if you have a two scale, I say you have a, observe the Q square much larger than lambda QCD and also uh, much larger than the PT uh, another scale. In that situation, the cities and also Joya at the low PT region, in that case, you can do, need a TMD factorization. You can generate a spin asymmetry from non-vanishing transverse momentum uh, distribution. So that's exactly the asymmetry is connected to the TMDs. So those are the current understanding. Now I'll give you an example. The first one you already went through, that's inclusive DI to zero. So now to say, let's do the collinear factorization case. There's only one single hard scale. Can you generate the spin symmetries that big? The answer is yes, but only approach the edge of phase space. That's exactly consistent with data. So collinear factor is the Bayer leading power. Then that look at the, what's the cross section as I mentioned earlier, is the sum of the amplitude with the same initial state, same final state. So far, we concentrated the situation where the hydron only contribute a single proton. Then we say when we pull off the multiple proton from a hydron to the hard collision, we pay a penalty of the, skip, the time difference. It's a one over cube. So by in terms of cross section, you can imagine you can have a single active proton contribute to the cross section. You have a twist two structure function, twist two structure function we learned early, then multiply a hard part. But this part is very large. Then uh, you know it's a very difficult for these terms to compete for the cross section. That's why we only concentrate on these for spin average cross sections. 
But however, if you go to the, the next term, you pay a penalty of the one over Q, but you can have situation contribute to the rate to the two three distribution, which comes from interference between these two. When you have this interference, you pay a penalty of Q, you say, well, PT is large. This problem term is very small. But I will demonstrate to you this interference term related to this H1 is always related to slope of the distributions. When you go to the cross section, go to very high, go to edge of face space, large XF, you know, the cross section fall very fast. That means the slope is big. Then this is enhanced by slope. So then you will find that this con contribution actually is big when you go to the region when the slope changes dramatically. So in the central region, it's zero. It's almost a small, tiny. But when you go to forward, yes, it's very important. So that's the actual reason. Then also this has a tremendous impact on understanding on the quantum interference. Then now, now I'm going to give an example. So let's take a difference of a, this exact cross section. Then you notice the first term, as we demonstrate by early paper, John Pump and the Replica company, company, then you will find that this is actually it's canceled from, when you take a difference. This is not sensitive to the spin. Then there's a, the first one really contribute is that this uh, F3 term, so sometimes we use the T3 with a half part produce a parton, the parton fragment. Then you can have a different combination to contribute that. But most important, the physics behind it. QCD is vector interaction. I told you early, the reason you get that symmetry from the early work, you have to have proportional mass of a quark. So the core mass of quark help you to flip a spin. Well, QCD is also much richer than just the part of model picture. You can imagine you can have a situation at amplitude, you have an active quark, say spin half. Then the complex conjugate, because the symmetry requires the amplitude complex conjugate to flip a spin. Now, how can you achieve that? If you have that interaction, the quark will stay with the same place you never can achieve. Yeah. So, well, you can have a composite state. Quark the gluon. You can have a quark the gluon combined together as being minus half. So imagine the quark amplitude goes this way, spin is positive, helicity positive. This quark had to be same, helicity positive, but the gluon could be opposite the spin direction. So you can get a minus half and a half, you can flip a oops. You can flip a spin between. Then also you can do the fermentation pictures. So this is exactly the reason if you do this measurement, you direct access this uh, uh, so-called to three distribution, which does not have probability interpretation. It's not the square of same number of a quantum state. In this case, amplitude is one particle, com complex conjugate is a two particle composite state. You can apply to this gluon, you can have single gluon, a two gluon, gluon is spin one, but a two gluon can easily give you minus one state. So that's exactly direct quantum interference if you can measure that. So now the how to construct, how to understand this twist through distribution. What's the physics behind it? So I started with the twist through distribution, uh, follow the way what the Ian told you, how I'm going to construct the TMD from the normal PDF and how to construct the in that way. Then I start with the, the one we all know, the quark distribution have this operator, gluon distribution have this operator, or helicity distribution have this operator, and neglect of KG link which make things, you know, does not change the real argument, but make this a little bit too long, right? So neglect all the gauge link. So those are the norm from twist two. How to construct a twist three distribution will contribute to single spin symmetry. Actually, it's very easy. It's a uh, Zumba Khan I wrote down the complete set in 2009. We factly show that you need an additional operator sandwich between. If you think about quantum mechanics, this is imagine like a wave function, a state, wave function, a state. <laughs> then you have a new operator sandwich between. Then give you actually this operator and the P and the T operation. Then you will give you the contribute to single spin symmetry. Then this operator have two types. is all related to the uh, F. This is exactly related to color Lorentz force. That means that the, the, the gluon inside your, your proton play as a source of the force then move the, this quark when you do the symmetries measurement. So I show you that, uh, gave you intuitive. So I gave you a specific definition, one of them. In this measurement, measure this uh, uh, distribution, it's really quantum, direct quantum interference between the composite state 
interfere with a single proton state. But in terms of matrix element, is nothing but the normal twist two distribution with this additional operator as an expectation value, you can say, of this operator. That operator is nothing but just the color Lorentz force acting on that. So I gave you that very intuitive picture. You can see, you can derive, you can convince yourself why you can flip it. So what happened is, uh, let's uh, say, imagine, uh, like yesterday, I talked about how to think about the factorization. If you have two hydrons come in, Lorentz contraction, the, the, EM, the picture is very similar, is gauging the color flow. Now, in this case, uh, the, then longitudinal contribution with power, and that will be, uh, uh, on, well, it's getting a leading contribution, but can be grouped into the gauging. So, but in this case, it's a transverse motion. So I have an idea is that I have a hydrogen imagine as being the transverse direction. So I have a generate field, magnetic field, which is a force, is that kind of floating around. Then I have a charged particle coming, hit it. So I apply the very well-known, the Lorentz force formula. The momentum of the particle is shifted, then because of the Lorentz force. So that tells you, you in fact, we generate a symmetry. Immediate, if we imagine the system is symmetric, that interaction actually will generate the symmetries. So that force, so then you, this is a normal, we write in three dimension. Now you convert it to the, uh, the covariant form. You, you try to write it in uh, this uh, indices into the zero, one, two, three. Now you do this, imagine this is a rest frame. I boost this uh, rest frame, goes to this Lyco frame plus momentum frame, no, this, uh, the, in the plus direction. Then when you do that, you immediately write this in terms of the four epsilon tensor, tensor of the F, which is nothing but the operator in that matrix element. So that tells you exactly the color Lorentz force it generate a symmetric uh, motion of the quarks. So that's a uh, uh, intuition. Then I gave you something to scare you. You know, in a quantum theory, just like a PDF, just like a, a strong interaction coupling constant, all depend on the scale you probe. Then what happened to this two three distribution when you change the scale? Experimentally already show when you have a low energy it seems to asymmetry the big, but you got the rick asymmetry is now zero, but again in a little smaller. So they evolve at the scale you probe them. So the same thing, it's like a deep lab, you have a Ricker equation for PDF. So Khan and I derived the full set of evolution equation for twist three operator, which contribute to spin average asymmetries. Then involving the different combination operator I gave them before, all built upon the twist two, but add additional color Lorentz force. Then they evolved the evolution kernel, then all this is derived it. So this is a formula, general formula. Then this kernel can be derived. I remember I gave the example how the evolution kernel they are universal, can be derived by calculating the platonic cross section, or you derive direct renormalization from the operator. And uh, so, but I list a different way, many different ways to calculate. So now I give you an example. So I direct from operator definition. So what you really have is a state. I have imagine you have star with a symmetry you measure at the original, the projection of the defined the, the uh, twist three distribution. Then through evolution interaction, they end up with another state. So then you define another projection operator. So then you can see if I have this particular diagram, I can derive it in terms of the distribution with uh, all this uh, convolution with a perturbative calculator hall part. This is a little bit longer, but it's a very much like I showed our last lectures about derive this, uh, uh, this one loop, the holistic distribution, the evolution kernel. Then you just calculate one loop diagram, you extract the coefficient of logarithmic dependence, that gave you the kernel. So uh, to save time, I'm not going through any detail here, but it's in the paper. But if anyone interested, I would be happy to talk to you. So after that, then uh, the question is, uh, say, that's the collinear factorization. You only have a single scale. So what the real physics behind it is a twist three distribution. What the twist three distribution is the proportional integral of the transverse momentum of the part time because they hide into the dis twist three distributions. So because you have to have transverse momentum to generate that. So they, but the, because they only have a single half scale of the half part, you're not sensitive to part the transverse momentum. So the transverse momentum is integrated to the matrix element end up with twist three matrix element. But if you go to TMD situation, the observable involving two scale, as we learned yesterday from uh, Ian's talk, 
if the transverse momentum you observe is very sensitive to transverse motion of a parton, you can have direct access to transverse motion of the parton. So in that case, you have two scales. So the how the TMD factor relation can generate single spring symmetries. That's another natural example. So then let me, because you hear a lot in this uh, uh, school about the civil factor, Collins factor, I will tell you more moment, they form the spin asymmetry, how the QCD can TMD factorization can generate. So first I write down the TMD factorization proved and also in terms of the general decomposition. And I show you earlier the cross section for inclusive DS, they can return in terms of in terms of the four structure functions, for unpolarized, you have a two structure function, F1, F2. For polarized one, have a two structure, G1, the G2. Once you allow the transverse momentum for TMD factorization, then I'm not going through the details, but I'll tell you there are 18 structure functions. They're involving two hadrons. Whenever you have TMD factorization, all of them involving two hadrons. Then you have 18 structure function, but that's a structure function, this part, had nothing to do with the detail of the QCD. Just like we write in a cross section in terms of structure function F1, F2, for unpolarized G1, G2, for the polarized, they're not the very sensitive time that the, what I say is uh, there's a QCD, but the, for just from the electromagnetic interaction, the symmetry of QCD, you derive it. So you derive the 18 of the function, that's the 18 functions, but what I will concentrate on is the part of it depend on the spin of the transverse spin of the hydrogen. This part has six structure functions, but not the old structure function can be factorized the part on distributions. Those are absorbed from a symmetry. You say there are 18 scalar function. I can describe that cross section. Next step, you have to show those the function can be factorized to distribution of quarks and gluons, right? So then, well, next slide tells you, so only eight of the 18 function can be factorized in terms of the convolution of the TMD at the leading power, Eon is going to tell you how to do that. But here I just tell you, as a, except as a result, only eight of them can be factorized. But how they factorize to the spin average one, complete spin average one, they can factorize the two TMDs in the semi QTS. You have TMD from initial state and TMD from final state to the hydrogen you observe, two TMDs with a convolute transverse momentum of the part of transverse momentum for energy momentum conservation connected to the observed transverse momentum. All this is defined in the photon hydron frame. Then what about transverse spin symmetry? Then they depend, on, I mentioned to you earlier, for lepton hydron scattering, not only define a symmetry, but also another very important, you, have a, you can define a leptonic plane. You have lepton scattered to lepton, you have defined a plane. You have a hydron coming, the cation come out, define a hydronic plane. Then the cross section is a function of angle between these two plants. So once you have that distribution, you can construct different angle modulation to extract the different thing you want to extract. You will find those functions. Actually, it's very interesting. For the Silvers function, the known as Silvers effect is related to this particular angle modulation, the sign of the hydronic angle between the two plants. I showed uh, that spin vector. Then the Collins function that you will say, what is the civil function? What is the Collins function? I will tell you at the end of my lecture. <laughs> at the moment, they take them as independent, the TMDs. So you can extract from this measurement as symmetries, okay? So then the question is uh, say, okay, but we know those functions. So before I tell you more connect the TMD to Ian's talk, I want to say, use one slide to talk about orbit angle momentum. You, you know this uh, because uh, we say the spring program, you have a holistic distribution, there's the orbital angle momentum contributions. There, there in the community, there are two definitions for orbital angle momentum in terms of operator. One is I can imagine is exactly space derivative because uh, you know the orbital angle momentum, R cross P, right? What to convert it to the quantum mechanically, you say I have an operator sandwiched between the, the wave functions or in this case, the field, then R cross P is a special momentum is defined by Jeffy, uh, Bob Jeffy and uh, uh, as Manaha. So the known as orbital angle momentum for the quark. Shanton G proposes slightly different, have a covariant derivative. As you can see, this is mixed with the gluon, but it's a well-defined quantities. So the question is, uh, as I say, none of them are direct physical observable. So how eventually to test them, you want to measure physical observer to, well, to extract them. And, the, and also from theory, what's the difference between these two? Because they have an operator definition, 
you can uniquely study the difference in the, in the operator form. If I take a difference, that's exactly related to the operator with the side by side with gauge link. Then in between the difference of these two operator is nothing but the same operator I show you earlier for generated single spring symmetry, color Lorentz force. So what the difference between these two operator is that coming from the difference between special derivative and the gluon part is exactly color Lorentz force inside. So in a sense, but the color Lorentz force is dot product to the moment position. So this is actually different from the, what I shall tell you, the color Lorentz force generate a symmetry, the motion. By this case, you direct the force dot to the position. What's that torque? The, the hard to change angle momentum between or the orbit angle momentum between this is the definition is exactly the effect due to the color the torque generated by color lens of force. So that physics actually Matthias Burkhardt in his lecture, I'm sure he will tell you all the detail about that. So this is the one slide I want to show you. Then I want to tell you to look at the Matthias Burkhardt's talk. So now I'm going to connect it to other part is connected to another important concept you are here in this lecture. Say, remember I told you the factorization basic requirement factorization is you have to demonstrate that physics taking place at different scale be connected by partons on mass show are pinched. That means the phase space integration force you to the contribution dominated coming from the region when the parton is on show. Well, it's true if the partons are on shell, that's how we define the TMD, right? You can have both longitudinal momentum and transverse momentum. But same time, what if you do the experiment as not to do the cross section, you square with the amplitude, so the momentum incoming, outcoming, uh, hydrogen is the same. Suppose you do defective scaling, you have lepton hit the proton, proton stay intact, going to the final state. So now you're dealing with a matrix element have the incoming momentum, outgoing momentum different by momentum shift delta. If that's the situation, you have a matrix sum involving both, say, momentum, hydrogen momentum shift, as well as, well as the partial momentum has a both longitudinal transverse momentum fraction. So that case is exactly defined as, but also I mentioned it had to be on show to get the, be able to factorize for physical cross section. In general, this matrix sum is not something you can factorize from distribution, except they are dominated by the observable. This active part is a pinch to be on shell. So then the non perturbability the chance virtuality, having to integrate over these, gave you a function. This function depend on the X and the KT, as well as the momentum shift between these. This is known as generalized TMD. So you will hear the talk from Matthias and also in the, the ham, TMD handbook. So you have a TMDs, have the momentum hydrogen incoming and outgoing the same. Generalize the TMD, same operator, the proton level, but a hydrogen level, the momentum in and the momentum out are different. So they generalize the TMD. So those are actually will relate to the three dimensional picture. If you integrate over the transverse momentum fully transform into position space, you get a so-called Wigner function, then they're all connected to three-dimensional picture of a hydrogen in position space. So I'm not, Matthias will tell you a lot more about that. So I just connect to some physics, you, you know, you are here to the one you already know. So the lattice, well, lattice can calculate these things, right? Lattice can calculate this matrix element. So, so far the knowledge from lattice calculation in the decomposition is that the, typically they say, the total angle momentum coming from up quark, down quark. For lattice, you have two types of contribution known as a connected diagram or disconnected diagram. Then you will find that this is the percentage. So most of them coming from the uh, connected diagram, disconnected diagram is small. But if you divide it into the orbiting and momentum, holistic contribution, again, very similar. Quark holistic contribute about a quarter, quarter or close to 30%. Then gruon contribute another part the orbit angle momentum actually is important. So that's the current status from the lattice calculation. You will hear more from the uh, Fiala's talk. Yeah, Fiala's talk. So now, finally, this is the moment. Uh, how can you calculate structure function, structure the PDF TM directly on the lattice? Well, here is uh, what the PDF. 
PDF, I take a simple example, the quark quark correlator with the gauge link or with the gamma matrices in the position space, then Fourier transform get your part on the distribution. What that tells you the operator leave on the light cone. That's how the operator. Then this matrix on the number 30 cannot be calculated in the lattice QCD directly. Why? What the lattice QCD do? Passing legal formulas. You have an operator, you set weighted operator by exponential the action, the integral over all the configuration. This is exactly what I meant to as a passive nuclear formalism. You calculate expectation value of that operator. But what the lattice do, instead of exponential I, the action, they convert into Euclidean space. So you have exponential minus action. So that's a probability. So you can do the Monte Carlo calculation. You can do the, all the simulations. But if you change the time from Minkowski time to Euclidean time, if the operator you try to measure depend on time, that means you are simulating different things. It's not the same operator. So far, all the lattice calculation is that the operator is time independent. So when I change it to Euclidean space for my action to be exponential i s to the minus s then as a statistical approach probability, the operator should be time independent. So that's how the lattice people calculate the moment, they calculate delta sigma, delta g, because those are related to the moment of the distribution, related to local expectation of a local operator. They can calculate. But if we want to really know the pattern distribution depending on the momentum fraction x or TMD and GPD, then they depend on known local operators. They live on the light cone because they pro we probe them in the highly scary, larger momentum transfer, larger the component in the plus direction, they conjugate it to the operator in the minus direction in the position space. So they all live on the minus light cones. So these cannot be directly calculated in the lattice QCD. Well, Shenton Ji had a wonderful idea. His idea say the so-called quality PDF, they define the distribution, not the PDF, is in the separation of the Z direction, no time dependence. So you can't create a correlation, a space-like correlation of the two field, but they are not the PDF. Well, the argument is very simple. We know the distribution, part of the distribution is boosting value. Once you define, no matter what the hydron momentum is, it's the same thing. But once you, and also given by two, two operators, but once you define this way, this operator no longer twist two, have all the twist. And also this matrix are no longer boosting that depend on P. In some sense it's the bad, but on the other way it's good, you take advantage of it. Because if the P goes to infinity as a Lorentz transformation, this you store at a, you can, as a home exercise, homework, at the separation in the Z direction, when your P go to infinity, do a boost, you will find you can infinitely close to the light cone. So what the idea is, say, I calculate this matrix element, then I take the P, go to infinity, then try to see what the real matrix and connect to the PDF. It's a wonderful idea. But however, in practice, there are a few problems. Problem is that when you got in the lattice, you never can have momentum go to infinity because lattice momentum is a fixed by inverse size of lattice spacing. Never can go to, for so far the best they can achieve the two GV or close to three GV. So never can go to infinity. Then second one, he said, well, it's a good idea. Say I have a, this is a quantity to the Fourier transform as a quality distribution, but quality distribution is not the normal distribution. They say, okay, I'm gonna do the expansion at the momentum. When whenever they go to infinity, they go back to normal distribution, but there are some corrections. So he do this so-called large momentum effective theory. It's not the normal sense, E on top of the soft collinear factory derived from Lagrangian. Here is the sense it's a really Taylor expansion of the large momentum PZ. You know, the quantity is no longer boosting variant. You take advantage of that, you expand in the warm of PZ and the power correction. But unfortunately the power correction depend on the momentum factor. They are another variable. So this is a good, when the P go to infinity, this is a small, you can relate to the quality PDF to normal PDF with some perturbative calculator matching coefficient, but this, and so difficulty just like we studied so far is this power correction, or you can interpret the high twist contribution. You would have difficulty to go to understand the X go to zero, X go to one,
but it's good. You learned a lot of information. You extract the PDF from these, is it requires some of the inverse problem. So another very important concept. Then we know the cross section is physically observable. I told you from day one, renormalization is just a reparameterization of the theory. Cross section never depend on the how you renormalize the perturbative calculations. Yeah, but these quantities are not direct physical observable. They are gauge invariant, as I mentioned, gauge invariant is a necessary condition, but not sufficient. <laughs> they are not direct physical observable. So this matrix element, I define them as space-like part-time correlation functions. They, unlike the measure cross-section, they are not physically measure observable. They vary dependent on UV denomination. Actually, if you look carefully, this matrix have a power divergence. Then in that case, then you, you really have difficulty. Then the answer depends on how you renormalize it. So then number one, it's very important. Actually, we prove this matrix sum is uh, multiplicative renormalizable. That was a major improvement. We worked very hard to prove that. Once you have that, you can renormalize these quantities in terms of the ratio of the operator. This is a renormalized operator in terms of Bayer operator divided by the same <laughs> operator <laughs> sandwiched into any yeah. choice of a state. Does not depend on state. So you can choose any state. So, so far, there are several procedures to renormalize it. One is a non Armand approach. You choose this offshore parton state. When you choose the parton state, you can calculate this perturbatively. You have the regularization of some divergence, divergence canceled between numerator and denominator. But the problem is when you introduce the parton state, you have a collinear divergence. You introduce a, a challenger. So they have to do the offshore. Offshore, of course, you may have danger to break the gauge inference that led to a number of mistakes in the literature, especially for gruon case. Another proposal known as pseudo for PDF eight approach by an Antonia company, my colleague, they say I choose the hydron state at the P equal to zero. So in that case, you have same operator, you can take away the old divergence because we prove it's a multiplicative renormalizable. But the difficulty here, you cannot fix the renormalization because this point is non perturbed Then so we another approach that we propose actually there's a number of paper is to choose as a vacuum. You can, I prove this in the sense of what the operator you have, expecting very vacuum, the complete infrared collinear finite, except ultraviolet divergent, they are the same as the numerator. So they, they can use to renormalize it, but it's not unique, depending on how you renormalize it. So that's important. So the third one, that another approach I show you quickly. No, nope, it's uh, something you changed, I cannot move anymore. No, it's stuck. I'm almost done. They're complete to the end. <laughs> yes, good. So another approach is what the operator you work with is exactly a correlator. I call this the space like part time part time correlator depending on the position space Z. High, you want to have a localized probe means Z is small or high momentum. So in that case, you actually can apply the operator product expansion. In this matrix, you have two types, the core core correlator, or even you can have a current current correlator, any operators with the correlation. The bottom line is, as long as this matrix sum of this operator can be proved to be factorized in terms of the distribution you want to extract, PDF, GPD, TMD, these are the good operators. So this is often referred to as short distance factorization approach. In this approach is that you have the, if you do this a part on part on correlator link by gauge link. If you do the current current correlator, you link it by propagator. Then all factorize the short distance hard part with the make, uh, distribution you want to extract. But then again, no free lunch. That is power correction. But in this case, expansion in terms of small size of separation or Z is a power correction. So the fact that I formula, you do this, measure, calculate on the lattice, just like you do the measure experiment, cross section, can be factorized the distribution you want to extract, multiply something you can calculate, then you wear the power corrections. So you do that again, the inverse problem, you calculate this in the lattice for the distribution, this uh, matrix element, calculus in perturbation theory to this matching coefficient, then you do the global analysis to extract this, just like this part. So this, and to, to almost my conclusion for this part, 
is that we know the data. I told you, show you this before last time. Not only the experiment data. I can have the experiment data from the lattice. They all come to the matrix element, which are very sensitive to panic structures. Now I have, oops, I have a theory. I have a theory, I have all the related to the PDF, a TMD you learned, also in principle, the GPD and the fragmentations. So that's the factorization, connect the parton to the things you can measure. Then I do the global analysis using Monte Carlo approach or, or Bayesian statistics to help me to connect these two together to extract the distribution to improve that I can even take the machine learning neural network. So at the end of the day, I can derive the goal is I can do the structure in the one dimension, you know, the pattern distribution and the three dimension, the image and, and the momentum distribution and also special distribution. To conclude these, I have a, a couple minutes is to summarize connection to TMD you saw this from uh, Haiyan yesterday. Once you open up the system, you no longer have only three. I told you the is you only have a four spin state. You only have four spin state. Then this is one hour, 25 minutes. I set the limit. I will be done very quickly. Uh, second to the last slide. Then, so what happened is that uh, you have a four spin state. But because the parity time reversal you only have a three things. But once you open up a transverse direction and other vectors, so now I challenge you and the homework, then you can prove that in principle, you can fill up this table. You can say have in terms of the polarization of the uh, parton and the polarization of hydrogen. In this nucleon, say unpolarized, longitudinal pride, transverse pride, quark, you can say unpolarized, longitudinal pride, transverse pride. We know the three, this is the first day, but once you open up the diagonal, we have a three, this H1 is the same as my delta. So then this is the diagonal one. But once you open up a transverse moment, you have lots of more. But it's a homework trying to apply the P and the T. You can convince yourself you have a total eight independent. So a total eight independent TMDs for the quark. There are total eight independent TMD for the group. Then I did mention for the collinear case, we have three independent quark distribution, but only two independent gluon distribution, unpolarized yeah. distribution. There's no gluon transversity for the nucleon. You can nucleon spin half. When you flip, you only generate spin one. When you flip the transfer for the gluon spin one, when you flip that requires spin two. So you cannot do that. Then, so that's why the gluon collinear case only have a two independent. But once you open up a transverse direction, the quark have an eight independent, gluon have eight independent. That's, you can tell, well, that's bad. It's interesting to learn more about QCD and the hydron structure will be very difficult. It took about uh, 30 to 40 years to learn enough of PDF. What happened? Well, there's one great advantage of lepton hydron scattering, emphasize semi QDS. You can relate to the angle modulations. So if you do that, you can, if you want to extract this so-called Sievers function, then we look for this angle modulation between the leptonic plane, hydronic plane, that's angle. So Ian told me, he will tell you a lot more about this. So let me, final slide before my conclusion, the physics, why are we doing that? What can we learn by measuring this distribution? It's a nice distribution you extract. PDF, we know it's a probability to find a pattern, which contribute a lot for LGC program, discover new physics, but TMD more on the structures. So, well, it's interesting because this is not only their fundamental. Secondly, they really tell us the, the, how the pattern stay quantumly correlated with the hydron property, whether it's a spin or the, uh, the momentum. So that's very, very important. That's fundamental part of QCD. I start with a function, say, Sievers functions. What's Sievers functions? Sievers function in the sense corresponding to the physics, you have a proton is transverse polarized. But the function tells you the motion of the quarks inside the transverse proton has preference, depending on the direction of the thing. So, and also have preference on the flavors. If the up quark like to move in this direction, the down quark will prefer to the other directions. So that tells you a lot about the dynamics, how the bound state was constructed. That's Sievers functions. Then what the Collins functions, uh, another way, the Collins effect, they correspond to the final state. 
So I produce a core with a spin state. Then they will hydronize to the pi. Then that quality spec tells you if I have the spin, like flavor, certain flavor, the proton, they will prefer to move and the spin in the direction. They prefer to move either left or right. That is a preference. It's not the it's equal. So that also tells you emerges hydron depend on the quantum number of initial proton state. So that's again is a fundamental. So that the, another thing is that Yang will tell you a lot more about. Read the handbook. You can learn a lot. So now finally, I have to summarize. Then this does not work again. <laughs> okay, comes so last. Well, I want to say that KCD has been extremely successful in interpreting and predicting high energy experiment data. That's true. When the energy exchange logging M2 GeV, we do global fitting, have a multi thousand data point. The theory is so wonderful to explain the data. Then, the, but we still don't know much about the hydron structure, which is the emerging phenomenon of QCD. So the nuclear photography, we always explain as a new term, try to understand the nuclear structures. Then, so then that means, and the emphasize another important concept is that we have to go beyond the one scale observable. You need a new type of observable with a two scale, two distinguished scale. The larger scale to pin down the particle nature of the quarks ground. I told you, quarks ground is the field. They are not the particles. They are the fields. Then you, when you have large momentum transfer localized probe, you see the more particle nature of the quarks ground. But at the same time, you need a soft scale to be sensitive with the bonding of this quark ground to the hydrons. So you need a new scale, a two scale observable. You can study at a TMD. So the facility I mentioned the new why US spent two and a half billion dollars to construct the lepton hydron collider EIC in the sense is the ideal for two scale problem. I mentioned you have electronic plane, hydronic plane, you have modulation, you can extract the different the TMD. And another thing we didn't talk is the GPD related to special images of the hydrons. Then uh, so finally, there's a TMD, GPD, really accessible by hydrogen scary with polarized beam. That's polarization is very, very important. They encode a very important information on the hydron 3D structures. So I'd like to thank you and enjoy the rest of the school. Let's see, I hope uh, this microphone is working now. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, these lectures. Um, they were very good. My question is uh, about the GTMDs that you mentioned. I didn't get whether they are not connected to the orbital angular momentum. And uh, besides that, I would also like to know why do you consider them important? Well, thank actually, you. I believe in the GMD, there's a section, there's no very clear connection, simple connection between say angle momentum and TMD. The TMD connect to physical observable, angle momentum does not, we know relate to the motion, transverse motion. Now, I didn't mention the GTM. In the handbook, you will see, there, there is a number of paper referred to. And the certain model calculation, the angle momentum will connect to the T, specific TMD. But once you go to GTMD, there is a more better uh, direct connection the how the angle momentum connect to the certain uh, GTMD. But that's still open question. As I say, TM, we spent a 30 plus year, almost 40 years for the collinear physics. Now we, because the experiment improved and the theory improved because we have factorization, but not the full story, which is just beginning. That's why this collaboration is important. We get every, you participation important, get interested, you can contribute. We still have a lot of open questions. Then, uh, including what you just asked, the connection. What's the best connection? So I believe that one of the general uh, GPD will have better connection to angle momentum. It's in the, one of the section later. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, one of the lecture, uh, Michael Engelhaar is one of the authors related to that. Yeah. Any other questions in the room? Okay. Uh, actually, you uh, connected the twist three with the. Dynamic line, right? So I didn't hear clearly. Sorry, okay. I'm sorry. When My ear is so painful because this sketch. <laughs> <laughs> like in one of these slides, you uh, defined the twist three uh -huh. with the dynamic of, of glands, right? 
two three then uh, define the two three distribution then yeah you connected with the dynamic of a glands right uh-huh yeah dynamic and, of yes yeah. absolutely and and um another definition of twist three is how much uh, or uh, how it depends on the proton momentum so if sub sub uh, if, if it's like um, multiplied by the momentum of the proton or divided by momentum of the proton then it's a uh, twist to three how we can match these two uh, definitions oh, oh, oh i see so what happened is uh i have defined um what's the twist three in the quantum correlation in this operator defined between the single proton state a uh, core ground co composite state physics this is very important actually you ask a very important and the real observable show this not observable you have a composite state. They are not sensitive to individual momentum of quark and gluons. What happened is you have to integrate all the gluon momentum. Uh, it's a rather, you can integrate all the quark momentum, but total momentum on the quark and gluon composite state should be exactly the same as a single quark state. So they, that's an integration in my model about interpretation. Remember that is a phase space integral. I have to integral the position it will fully change the momentum space is going to equivalent to integral with all the possible momentum of that combination with the condition the sum is equal to momentum of the active part from other side. Yeah. Any questions from Zoom? Leave me a chat if you'd like to speak up. Don't see him. Oh. Yeah, I just had a quick question with uh, going back to GTMDs. Sure. When you said one of the assumptions was that the partons were on shell, are you assuming that those are then like the external lines, or are you working with on shell propagators? Because I never know. Uh, no, 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 this is a part of fact. In the part never on shell. Just like a DIS cross section or TMD factor in the part active part never on shell. So what happened is you have to integrate the virtuality of the parton, as we discussed in the last, last lectures, but the integration, particularly dominated by pinch, because especially when you square, then, uh, so that's uh, for the PDF uh, TM daily related to cross section. So active parton momentum and uh, the complex conjugate have an opposite I epsilon. So when you integrate the inverse mass of the momentum of the active parton <coughs> and the complex conjugate, they always dominate by region on shell when the case square equal to zero if the mass is. So then you do the factorization, say as approximation, whatever the momentum part of entering the hard part as approximation to be on shell because of typical part of momentum bounded by hydron state is a virtual, is an order of Fermi or lambda QCD. It's so small compared to the half scale. So show this in half part, half scale dominate the virtuality parton, active parton, so small compared to half scale. So you do the, in a sense, Taylor expansion, you keep the first term. So you, uh, let the parton moment entering half part to be virtual, to, uh, to be on shell. Then the virtuality is always there. You never can throw away the integration. The DK square will be included in your matrix sum definition. That's the long distance part. So now the GTM difference between GTMD in general, when you do the diffractive process, this is actually a very good question for the really cross section like TMD, PDF, you naturally see that positive epsilon, negative epsilon. But when you do the diffractive process, the proton and the scattered proton are all in the amplitude. They are not in the complex conjugate amplitude. So what happened, the propagator, if you exchange the quark, anti quark, like a DVCS type, of, then you realize the quark operator, a propagator, and the quark coming back, the propagator, they all have plus epsilon. So they, they are not to say they naturally have pinches in gravity. So in my paper, to prove factorization of a heavy quark pair production in the final state, it's the same thing. And the amplitude you have a, a QQ bar pair. A lot of people do the calculation, actually, the quark, uh, charm quark on shell. But in the QCD, they're not, they're all the virtual. Offshore. But in my paper, that proof factorization, that specific subsection, I say, what the condition? You can treat the quark, anti quark, they are on the, on the same line to be on shell as approximation because the pinch is in everything. 
is the condition when the invariant mass of a pair so much smaller than the energy of the pair. Same as a factorization of GTMD, when the momentum flow from the diffractor hydron to the hot process is much larger than the invariant mass of the pair, you can approximately treat the parton on shell. You can, it's a simple exercise, the homework. Again, two minute homework assignment. Now, if you look at my paper, I have the specific example. Why, what condition, if the both part on the amplitude, why they can be treated on show. The, and when they're on the complex hundred amplitude, it's easy because I epsilon minus I epsilon, you can naturally see it. But if they're both on the amplitude, how can you see it? But that's on show the approximation. Approximation with the condition, the invariant mass of the pair had to be much smaller than the energy of the pair. Then you can prove that singular, singular, two, you also have two singularity with minus integration. They, the pole will move, move, move close to the pinch. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John Wei. Uh, I'm gonna close the session so we can have a little bit of a break before the next lecture, was it, which is at 11 Mountain by Ian Stewart, second lecture on TMDs uh, on Zoom. And uh, yeah, we have coffee in the back. So um, by the way, I requested that they not give us decaf because I don't think anyone was drinking it. But, uh...